Crypto Trader is proudly brought to you by eToro. Discover a simpler way to trade and invest in cryptocurrencies and more. So they called it the tangle in Taipei, and boy, what a tangle it was. Nouriel started off, and he came out the gates, and instead of talking about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, he went straight for Arthur and Arthur's business. He used a lot of big words. I mean, he pretty much said that you're running a gambling operation that's unregulated or regulated in some jurisdiction that's not regulated. How did you feel when he, when he started off like that? Well, he obviously didn't really want to talk about Bitcoin and the merits of the technology. He wanted to speak about a particular business. No, I mean, I love BitMEX and I think we're a great company, we're doing great things, but the underlying technology of Bitcoin wasn't really talked about. So to me, it sounds like, you know, Bitcoin has value, it's still here. He can't attack an actual protocol for his lack of knowledge of what's going on. He had to go for me personally. And he did go for you personally. Indeed, he accused you of running basically a gambling operation. He said, called me a drug pusher. He dro called you a drug pusher, running in an un unregulated mm. environment. Now, let's talk about BitMix. Yeah. You're an ex-banker. You're an ex-derivatives guy. What brought you into crypto and specifically into derivatives in crypto? So I'm, a, you know, as, as you said, a derivatives trader. And when I discovered Bitcoin and saw what the potential it could do for the human society, I thought, well, for financial inclusion and all these other things, nothing changes except for every 200 to 300 years. And so at these inflection points in how human society changes value between each other is massive chaos. Business models go out of business and companies ascend. And I wanted to be one of those companies that was at the turn of the way that we move value between each other. And that's what I saw in Bitcoin. Now I'm, a, you know, what can I do in this industry? I know derivatives, so I thought, let me build a place where people can trade, leverage financial products because that's what I know. Why, what is it about derivatives that makes it so attractive and specifically to this market? Why are derivatives so important? Well, in normal FX and any other asset class, the derivatives market trades in much higher volumes than the spot market. Now, there's people who are speculating, providing liquidity to the market. There are people who actually need to hedge future payments, future delivery of goods, and they're all using these financial products. There's people who want to take certain risks and pass them on to other individuals willing to take that risk. That all happens in derivatives. And at the end of the day, the more derivatives trading, the more liquidity, the more businesses can use a particular asset. That's what we want to bring to Bitcoin and crypto. When I got started with BitMEX, the derivatives market paled in comparison in terms of liquidity to the spot market. And now today, we eclipse all of the spot markets by mag orders of magnitude. Which is normal for every market. In fact, in every market, the derivatives market is always much bigger than the underlying market. But there are derivatives and there are derivatives. A normal derivative doesn't have 100x leverage. And it seems like the key product that you've got is the 100x leverage on the perpetual swap. Tell me the secret sauce behind that specific product. So the number one thing that we're very good at is taking complex financial derivatives and hitting them with a simple stick and coming up with a product that we can actually give to our retail consumer base and allow them to trade intelligently. So this is a very exotic derivative um, in the back end. We were able to package it in a way that retail traders felt that they were trading on margin. And that's brought immense liquidity to the market. And we're able to allow people to hedge larger amounts of risk because we've created such a speculative beast of a product. A speculative beast of a product indeed. In fact, Bitcoin by itself is already referred to as a highly speculative, highly volatile, volatile product. Now you add 100x leverage that. Are you running an operation that, that entices people, people who are almost gamblers, people who want this adrenaline rush? You said yesterday on stage that you're actually in the entertainment business in a way. Is that how you see it? Absolutely. I see all financial training as entertainment. When I, I used to trade on a trading floor at investment banks. It's a lot of fun. Um, there's adrenaline rushes when you're making you know, 10, 20 million dollar risk prices on a particular stock or, or ETF. It's a lot of fun. Trading is fun. Now, the traditional asset markets, the volatility has fallen. Interest has fallen. A number of IPOs has declined. Trading volumes has declined. So humans love to trade. And because the traditional markets, you, there's various reasons why the liquidity has disappeared from these markets. They're looking for something else. They want to be entertained. Now, people can call that gambling or speculation, but that's just humans being humans. And this new asset class, because of the potential opportunity that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies represent, and the people who hate it for what it intrinsically could mean to their way of business, this is where you get this amazing volatility that traders want to capture.
Okay, now that's the trading part of it. And the trading part of it is very much entertainment. Let's talk about some of the criticisms that Nouriel had around Bitcoin. And he says, he's tr what he says is true. Bitcoin does five transactions per second, there or thereabout. It's not really a good form of payment. There are better forms of payment like Alipay and the equivalent of India. What are we saying back to him as an industry? We're 10 years old. Why do we not have a better comeback than, I think your comeback was, it's people's choice if they want to go into Bitcoin, if they want to be in decentralization. Shouldn't we as an industry be much further ahead? But I think giving consumers choice is one of the key value propositions of this new ecosystem. We, ent we actually did the 2008 financial crisis and people wanted to do something different. This represents something different. Now whether or not it's going to invade all manner of your financial life, I don't know, but at least now today you have a choice between centralized government, central bank money, which is how we've been operating our financial systems for thousands of years, and one governed by open source code, math, and cryptography. Let's let people choose and see what happens. Don't get so angry that it, people actually have a choice in their financial future. He took you on about regulation. He took you on about the fact that you're regulated in Seychelles, and um, Seychelles is probably not the most regulated ju jurisdiction in the world. Do you think that there is perhaps an element of regulatory arbitrage that you're playing in to give you such a successful business? I don't think so because we've actually had to remove one of the largest potential markets from our client base, the United States. So regulatory arbitrage would say that we would locate ourselves in the Seychelles and then flout U.S. securities laws to offer our products, which we're definitely not doing. So just because you locate and you know, put yourself in a jurisdiction does not absolve you of uh, adhering to financial regulations. So we're a very compliant organization all around the world. Okay, where to from here in terms of financial products? You've got a very successful business running high leverage Bitcoin and other coin uh, swaps, uh, um, uh, derivatives. What happens next? What's the roadmap? What are we excited about in terms of developments in that area? Um, so we're really excited about uh, upgrading our technology. So our products are so successful that we have eclipsed the ability for us to handle all of the volume that wants to trade on our platform. So we're even embarked on probably a 12 to 18 month project of a completely rewriting how we match trades uh, on our trading engine. So that your trading will be quicker, so that there'll be less downtime? Yeah, trading quicker, we can support more products, we can actually allow more people to trade larger amounts on our platform. So building on the success of proving that there's a product market fit for the type of derivative that we offer to the market, we now need to upgrade our technology to take our trading volumes to the next level. So instead of hitting $16 billion a day, we can handle $100 billion a day and bring even more liquidity to this market. Because yes, we're doing really well financially and in terms of the volume, and it's great that we're hitting all-time highs, but the CME does you know, one to two trillion US dollars of derivatives trading notionally a day. We're nothing. So we need to upgrade ourselves so we can compete with these types of exchanges. We're not content just to be where you are today. So is that the goal? Is the goal to become the CME of digital instruments? The goal is to become the CME of everything. And everything is going to be a digital instrument? It could be. A, we think it'll be digital instruments, um, but we want to be, in terms of volume perspective, in that same class. Now, we think that that's going to be on the back of the digitization of trading, which is, you know, started in the late 90s and continues today, and as cryptocurrencies, digital tokens, and all these representations of value move from an analog form to a digital form, we think that our way of trading and the generational shifts in how people want to trade will favor our business model over a traditional exchange. Yesterday you spoke on stage and you brought up fixed income derivatives, or fixed income products, uh, crypto products. Tell us a little bit more, more about your plans in that sphere. So essentially what we want to create is right now, one of the biggest criticisms about Bitcoin is that it's not used for um, commercial payments. The big problem with that is any merchant that actually offers Bitcoin as a payment is not natively pricing their asset in Bitcoin. They price it in dollars usually, and some company helps them FX a Bitcoin price. Um, the Bitcoin is sent to an address, it's sold immediately, and the merchant gets their dollars. And there's bleed, and there's price changes along the way. Right. So what we need to happen is that from farmer to restaurant, people are pricing their good or service natively in Bitcoin. That can only happen when the cost of funds for this entrepreneur is in Bitcoin, which means they need to be able to borrow. 
Bitcoin. There needs to be an interest rate for people to actually price themselves and their credit worthiness versus a basket of very stable companies and go out to the market and borrow Bitcoin. Now we want to help establish that market. We want to be one of the companies, the highest quality companies that actually don't need the money to actually go out there and issue these types of products. Now so, more details about this will be coming out in a few weeks, but that's sort of the overarching theme to what we're trying to do. So I'm going to push you here because you said that you took your own money and that you, 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 you borrowed your own money to create this No, no, instrument. people have borrowed, have lent us money. People have lent you money even though you don't need loans. Correct. To create these, these derivatives, these, these products, these fixed income products because you want to start a market. Correct. And when is this market going to launch? Um, so the first deal will be announced uh, in, in the next few weeks. And this is, this is just you know, a very small deal. The, this will take years to develop, but it's never going to start if some of the leading companies don't essentially pay money to start a credit market. Now this is something that you know, Alexander Hamilton advocated for you know, governments. Governments should, if, even if they don't need the money, establish a credit market of the most credit worthy institution, which is a central government, to spur creation of credit in an economy to jumpstart it. So this is not a new concept. We're really borrowing what governments have been doing um, since the beginning of time. Now you service the, the East and the West. You've got uh, customers in, in the West, theoretically none in the USA or very few in the USA, and you've got a whole lot of customers in the East. How do you see the difference in culture between the people in the East and the people in the West? We get the feeling that the people in Asia and in the East are much more advanced and, um, and better adopt these technologies. Is that what you get on your platform in terms of adoption? The reason why Asia dominates uh, crypto trading and sort of the developments and the largest companies are based out here is because we have a generation of people who basically were mobile first. They have high smartphone penetration, very fast broadband internet and very low, I would say, economic mobility in a lot of these countries. After the whole manufacturing revolution in the, you know, the 70s, 80s, and mid-90s, what you're left with are a lot of very wealthy families and very low financial mobility for the young people. And they see crypto as this opportunity. They're very highly educated, very technical, and they have the ability to access the internet, which is a perfect combination for crypto. And that's why you see so much energy in this region relative to a traditional, say, US or, or Western European market where technology doesn't need to be that advanced because the banking system they works for a, people. They don't have a need for it. They're banks. The banks work. There's enough financial products. They can trade all sorts of funky options and swaps and all ETFs. And there's so many things that people can trade. Bitcoin's just another one of those things. It's not that compelling. Overall, you probably had an expectation of what this debate would go like. You probably set up and you know, prepared stuff. And How was the reality versus the expectation? Um, I thought we'd talk about more about Bitcoin. But you know, it went very, I guess, personal if you want to call it that. And uh, I feel like Nuriel was a broken record. He said the same thing about 15 different times. He really didn't advance his arguments on why Bitcoin was you know, a scam and all of these, uh, these different altcoins were going to zero. He just kept repeating the same thing. So I felt it was a kind of short change, some real um, deep thought into what he actually believed. Are there any points where, that were negative against the crypto industry where you thought, you know what? He actually does have a point here, and as a crypto industry, we should improve. Well, I think that the best part about the crypto industry is that it's perfectly competitive. So, yes, I think one thing he brought up were you know exchange hacks and people losing Bitcoin because they held them in the exchange. Well, a, that's a bad business. Bad businesses should be punished, right? Now, obviously, there's an external cost to the market in that people's funds were stolen. But if Bitcoin is about individual financial sovereignty you shouldn't be storing the majority of your Bitcoin on an exchange when you're not trading with it. But critically speaking, banks get robbed all the time. They just have better insurance system and a central bank that usually... Well, the issue them. is that the central bank can print the currency. In a fiat world, the central bank can just print currency and plug a bank's hole. Now, maybe if we were on a gold standard, that would be different and people would have a different uh, view of you know, the infallibility of banks because the central bank just can't come to the rescue and just give them some more ones and zeros to get more, to get more bank notes. Do we need people like Nuriel in the industry to keep us in check? I mean, we, we, need, we need people like Nuriel to keep things interesting. At the end of the day, if Bitcoin is interesting, if there's not um, a diametrically opposed Bitcoin's great and Bitcoin's evil sort of clash, then people won't talk about it. If people don't talk about Bitcoin, no one can learn about Bitcoin. So, and if no one learns about Bitcoin, then industry never grows. So controversy, volatility is all needed in this call option that is Bitcoin in the cryptocurrency industry. Now, Arthur, you've built an amazing business and uh, you're a very wealthy man in your own right. 
but it couldn't have been easy. Let's talk about some of the hardships of building a business like yours. Because we all see the success story. We all see you as this crypto god who's got an amazing business out of leverage. Give us some of the, the backstories where you thought, am I going to make it? What were the toughest times in your business? Well, eventually we th initially we thought that we were going to build a, a platform for Wall Street. The institutions were going to flood into crypto in 2014 and start trading our type of... Uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen any institutions, have you? No, exactly. <laughs> so we went through, when we launched in November of 2014, in probably the subsequent nine months, we had vast stretches of periods of zero trades. Literally, nobody matched the trade on our platform for days on end. Who was funding you at this point? Where was the funding coming from? We were funding ourselves. It was bootstrap. And there no trades? No trades. No, no venture capital interest. No, everyone thought we were crazy for doing derivatives. Bitcoin spot's not liquid. How could you do derivatives? There's no market for this. Blockchain's cool. Bitcoin's bad. You're going to get hacked. Like all these negative things that people are saying. And our business model is definitely not, is definitely validating those with zero trading volume. What was the turning point? I mean, you, you were in this point where there was not tr no trading happening. What turned it? Was so, there one day that you woke up and looked at the platform and all of a sudden there were trades or? Well, we saw that, you know, we were focusing, we were trying to build this, you know, institutional platform for these people that didn't exist. But there was a very vibrant retail, small retail segment trading on our Chinese competitors, highly leveraged Bitcoin and crypto derivatives. So we said, oh, obviously our angle isn't working. We need to be a retail focused platform and we can do it better than our Chinese competitors because we can offer better financial products. And that's what we did. We went from three times leverage to 100 times leverage in the span of a few months. We changed our margin model and that's where we started kickstarting our success in the fall of 2015. So is that the secret sauce? Changing from three times leverage to 100x leverage and making the swap a perpetual swap? Well, in th this is before the perpetual swap. So, I mean, the, the two things that I say are you need to succeed in crypto and probably any exchange, leverage and liquidity. Now we didn't really have liquidity, but we could engineer a better financial product than our competitors and offer a higher leverage. And that's where we became known as the 100x leverage place. And that's how we gained our customer base. Okay, now let's talk about Bitcoin and the market. So you called the bear market, I won't forget because you're actually on CNBC. And you got on CNBC, on, got on CNBC and you said, I think this price is going lower. And that was when Bitcoin was at around $5,000 and it did go lower. Where are we today? We've had this bull run. We've got to about 11, uh, 14,000. We're back down to about 11,000, give or take. Where are we going from here? So I think we're going to chop between 10 to 20,000 for the rest of the year. I know some people think we're going to blow past uh, 20K, but if we think about how long it took for us to get from 1,000 to 10,000 in 2017, that took 11 months. So if we're going to hit another major milestone, basically getting back above uh, the high water mark, it's not going to be easy. It's not just going to be, okay, we went through 10,000 and now, you know, a month later we're going to be at, at 20,000. So there's going to be a huge amount of volatility in I think this 10 to $20,000 range. And I think we exit above 20,000 in early 2020. And so you're not buying this thing of going to 50,000 and 100,000 and this whole parabolic move. Well, it could happen in, in a parabolic move. I just don't think it's going to happen in a six month time frame. And one of the, the major trends that I see driving this is central bank money printing. Now, as the Fed probably cuts at the end of the year, the PBOC is doing triple R cuts, ECB is going to have to continue LRTO and all these programs, this money is not going to make its way really into the crypto ecosystem until it finances more money losing startups like Uber and Lyft and all these massive public companies. Once people get done with those, then they'll move down to the crypto ecosystem and that's where I see Q1 2020s when we really start getting the upward cycle. Institutional money or retail money? Um, I still think this is a retail-led phenomenon. If institutions cared about Bitcoin, they would be trading on the CME. The CME would be destroying volume for all the other exchanges. That's not happening. The institutions aren't here. There's no real clear value proposition. Goldman Sachs doesn't have a bunch of retail customers in South Korea, right? So why would they go and spend the political capital and the money to staff a trading desk when they can't even trade with the people trading crypto today? Is there going to be an inflection point where crypto does become an institutional game? What are the barriers? We kept saying that we didn't have enough custodian, we didn't have the right infrastructure. We've got custodians now, we've got infrastructure now. Are the institutions going to come and play with us? I think so, but who cares if they come and play with us or not? The industry is fine being a retail-led phenomenon. If you have to depend on selling into a large financial institution for the you know, sustenance of your business, good luck, I hope you have a lot of venture capital money. Decisions take years to onboard new financial products with all the regulatory complexities. So 
just stop worrying about them. Build a real product that the consumers around today actually want to pay for, and you will be successful. What about altcoins? Are we going to see an altcoin run? Everyone's waiting for this altcoin to run. Bitcoin went up. The alts got hit when Bitcoin went up. Do you think we're going to start seeing some kind of alt movement? I mean, absolutely, they'll, they'll rally off the bottom. Will they regain? Will most of these coins regain their all-time highs in 2017? I don't think so. Most of them were crap, and they'll continue to be crap. So it's not going to happen. Now, will it be a new type of vertical of digital token or coin or protocol that becomes sexy and just rips? I absolutely think so. Do I know what that is? I don't. Of the current coins, do you have any preferences or coins that you look at and say, you know, those coins are actually looking cheap now and are probably worth a buy? I don't really look too much at, at the at the altcoin space in terms of uh, uh, price action. It's really about as people think Bitcoin's too expensive in nominal terms. It's, a, it's an inf investor fallacy. They'll move to something that's worth a few satoshis, and that'll pump. Now, I, as I said, I don't think we're gonna you're gonna pair if you're holding it from the all-time highs of 2017. You're probably not gonna pair back those losses, but possibly if you're botting fishing, you can make a good amount of, amount of money in an altcoin rally. Okay, let's talk about the biggest news in the crypto industry, and that must be Facebook's Libra coin. Do you see that coin as a cryptocurrency as you and I define cryptocurrencies? Libra is not a cryptocurrency. I don't think it's Facebook's intention to ever make it a cryptocurrency. Libra is a basket of fiat currencies and an electronic representation of that basket. Its power is not in that. It's the power is if Facebook or other large tech companies allow their billions of active users to send payments between each other, they can completely disintermediate commercial and central banks. Is it going to be a good thing for our cryptocurrency industry? Does it have any effect on our cryptocurrency industry? People using digital money, using a digital cryptocurrency wallet, is that going to make more people interested in Bitcoin and Litecoin and Monero and Zcash? I think what it does is it allows humans to learn about existing in a purely digital realm because it's still very difficult for most people to conceptualize completely digital money. Now, if LibraCoin uh, and the social media apparatus around this coin makes it more palatable for people to learn about digital payments, that's a net positive. Because if humans can interact with digital money, then a subset of them will look at crypto and see value there. So net-net, you think that Libra is not competing with us? but it is going to do something for this industry. Absolutely. Do you think they're going to be able to launch or do you think the regulators are going to stand very much in their way? I, I would hope that if a company with Facebook's might and resources has enough powerful lobbyists to get this one through. Yeah. Arthur, it's been a great pleasure having you on our show and a great tangle that you had on the stage there. We continue our coverage of the Asia Blockchain Summit and all the big names are here and on the stage, one by one. And now I've just watched a talk with CZ. Now I've seen CZ talk many, many times, but this talk was very different. He spoke from the heart and he told us the story of the Binance ICO. CZ, let's go back to the, to, to the beginning. How did the idea of the ICO start? Well, the ICO, um, the idea was just getting harder as we were planning to do a new exchange. So originally we wanted to do the traditional way, so traditional fundraising, VC money, etc. But um, I saw another project doing ICO right before our eyes, and they raised like $50 million within 10 days. I was like, well, we could probably do that too. We have a little bit of reputation in the industry. We have a product, and uh, we, have, we have our experiences. And then, uh, but the final thing was the uh, hot pot dinner in Chengdu on June 14th. Uh, everyone's talking about uh, uh, ICO. Everyone's like, you should do an ICO, you should do an ICO. It's like, fine, okay, we'll do it. So you, you go to this dinner, this dinner that you showed us, and everyone says you should do an ICO, and the next morning you go back to your team and say, we're gonna start writing a white paper. It's actually not the next morning. It's like when I went to the hotel room at, uh, at around 11 p.m. at night, I just sent a message in our group, um, and I uh, just said, we wanna start right now. Uh, and we, we wanna get the white paper done in three days, um, and let's, let's get going. And, and how long does the white paper take? It took about, uh, the first version actually got out in, in three days, uh, but the final version took about a week. Yeah. So it took you a week to write a white paper? Yeah. What happened then? And then, uh, so we, so the first version, we had no advisors, right? So we, uh, you get the first draft and then you talk to your friends, you talk to people you know, say, do you want to be our advisor for basically like be your backer or be your uh, credibility backers at least. Um, a bunch of them said yes. And then you put their pictures into your white paper and then you issue, you, you release it and say, I'm going to do an ICO. 
um, and uh, on which date, and this is the date you buy, and uh, and you create WeChat groups or Telegram groups and let people come in, talk about it. And, and how long bef between the time that you decided you're going to do an ICO yeah. to the anniversary, which is actually today when you said two years ago, right? Right, right. Uh, so, uh, well, the, uh, from the beginning of the, uh, so June 14th is the day, June 14th, 2017 is the day we, had a, we said we're going to do an ICO. By July 2nd, we finished everything. We had 15 million US dollars in our, in our, in our wallet. So three weeks? Three weeks. Yeah. And how many people were working in the background? I know you called them the, the five pizza team, but yeah. how many people were working in the background making this happen? Uh, at the time, there were about 30 people in, uh, on the team, but uh, a large number of them were still focused on the product, the tech side. Uh, and we had to make a new website, and then we have the, mostly the marketing team was doing the sort of front facing, uh, doing the right ICOs. Uh, road sh uh, not road shows, like uh, live streaming, etc. Yeah. So, you do this ICO, yeah. 9,000 people sign up for the ICO, yeah. they buy the tokens, yeah. and the token starts trading and it starts trading below the ICO price. Yeah. And you mentioned that that was the, the most pressure time of your life. Now, yes. that was quite surprising for me, because I watched you when Binance got hacked, and I would have imagined that uh. that was much more pressure, but you said no, that it was more not. pressure that yeah. your token holders were losing money. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, it's, um, so the hack, the hack itself was high pressure, but we, we know we had the funds. So we lost, the, we lost quite a chunk of money, but it's, it's a large chunk. But percentage-wise, it's a much smaller chunk of money uh, than the uh, people lost on, on the valuation drop. So, and then we just finished the ICO that people invested based on our credibility, based on our reputation, and they, they trusted us with their money. And then as soon as we launched, the price went under ICO price. So, so what did you do? We tried everything. We tried like listing more, more coins, getting more users onto the platform, doing more promotions, training campaigns, uh, gas, to, gas to distributions. We tried everything. What yeah. were you thinking inside? I mean, you were the leader, you were the yeah. face. Yeah. Your credibility was at stake. Yeah. The ICO price was, you were 30% down on ICO price. Yeah. What were the thoughts going through your head? So, well, there's a couple of thoughts, right? So, uh, number one is we probably overvalued the ICO. We probably, have, we should, probably should have done a $10 million ICO instead of a $50 million, uh, or maybe even a $5 million ICO. Uh, number two, uh, we just got to keep building. We just, get, we just got to get users faster and faster so that we have a successful business so that the uh, value of the coin goes back up. So every, uh, I actually sent a message to the team saying, look, let's keep, um, keep our heads down, uh, ignore, or not ignore, just let's take the heat. Uh, but let's keep building. And that's what exactly what I said to the team. And you took your own money and started buying up Binance uh, BNB tokens? Yes. So I had a little bit of savings on the side. I took all of that, put into BNB. Which is probably a great investment now in hindsight. Uh, now that's worth a lot of money now. So actually, I, didn't, I forgot about this completely. After the BNB price went up, I forgot about, I forgot, like, I didn't, I don't, I don't really log into my account uh, on Binance. So I forgot about that for a long, long time. Next week, it's back to the studio in New York City. Until then, I'll be on Twitter at CryptoManRun, and you should trade well, my friends. <laughs>